just show you my attempt at putting it into a story. It's very raw and brutal and it feels like I actually get like a out of breath reading it because it makes me really emotional this poem I just think some poetry is really powerful and I don't know if it's like I don't know why because I've never been a soldier but this poem just always really like proper gets me when when I try and teach it so yeah I'm slightly out of breath from reading it just because it kind of panics me like the the emotion of it or his voice across time when you read it so yeah, I'm slightly breathless and you notice that, that's why. So I'm going to do the story now. So this is my attempt, like I say, at turning it into some kind of narrative because it is a story that's going on in the poem. So the first stanza, he's talking about how the soldiers have heads that are in pain because they're under constant pressure from those winds that I was talking about, the east winds, the iced east winds that neither us. Notice the painful and complex vowel shifts in that image. He says that we, the soldiers, are exhausted, but we stay awake because the night is silent and dangerous, is too dangerous to fall asleep or rest. Our memory of what we're supposed to be looking for is confused by the distracting, low drooping lights in the distance. Worried by silence, the watchmen whisper. They're curious and nervous, but nothing happens. So we're placed not in medias res, like some of the poems that you might be studying. We're not in the middle of an action. We're in this time where they're waiting for action. They've been trained for this moment for a long time. It's kind of the moment of life and death for them. And that moment never comes, it's just deferred. And while it's deferred, they're suffering. They're, you know, they're in pain from the cold. They're in panic from the potential threat or danger. It's nighttime and they're awake, which is inverted and unusual, but they can't afford to sleep. It might cost them their lives or it might lose them the battle. So it's really looking at the physical experience of a soldier, how it feels to be in that moment of war. Curious and nervous, but nothing happens. You'll notice the repetition of the idea, nothing happens as we go through. So stanza two, while we're watching, we hear the mad gusts of wind tugging on the barbed wire perimeters. It looks like the way in which dying men twitch in pain when they fall into the barbed wire. So it's important to know that the trenches that he's talking about, the way that the landscape is, uh, is laid out for these soldiers, they dig trenches and they kind of sit in them and they look over the top with their guns. And in between their trenches and the enemy, um, there's a lot of barbed wire, which is kind of extra protection. It stops people from just running straight at them. But also it's very uh, difficult, you know, to get through. And sometimes if a, if a man sort of is shot, they might fall into the barbed wire and start twitching. It's a really violent image. <laughs> it's not, not a nice poem. And, you know, like I was saying, it's one that makes you grow rather than one that's just kind of uh, comfortable. To the north is a never ending rumble and flicker of the guns. And it feels like it's the rumor of another war. It's so far away that it means almost nothing to them. They're so focused on their particular moment. It, it's just too abstract to hear these guns off in the distance in another part of the war. It, it's still the, their war that they're in now, but it feels distant, like they're sort of dissociated from it because the guns aren't close enough to be a danger to them personally. And we have this question, what are we doing here? So you can see this being quite similar to a lot of poems in the AQA collection where he's suddenly asking what on earth, <laughs> why, why am I here? What is the purpose of this? It seems very strange. It seems almost impossible to prepare for or train people to be able to withstand this kind of situation. But the situation is the opposite from what you expect. It's not action and violence and heroism and you know, strength and, and so on. It's, it's just kind of torment, like physical and psychological difficulty that they're placed in. 
the sharp, sad misery of dawn begins to grow. It's another day that will be just as hard as the last. We only know that war keeps going, rain soaks and clouds grow heavy and sag when a storm comes. Dawn gathers her army in the east, attacks us once more with rows and rows of grey. The rain, wind and snow, but nothing happens. So you might notice that it's kind of like he's uh, being attacked by weather, by nature itself. It's almost like nature is turned against these soldiers, like it opposes them being in a state of war. Again, bayonet charge is a really good one to look at if you're interested in, in the idea of human nature versus the rhythms of the natural world and how war might be opposed to the natural order or natural state of things. It seems like a very human thing for humans to kind of destroy each other in the way that we do, according to these poets, and probably me as well. <laughs> I think I would agree with them. Sudden flights of continuous bullets streak through the silence. They're less deadly to us than the cold air that shudders black with snow. So the nature is more dangerous and more deadly than the bullets of the humans. It's more powerful. With its snowflakes that flow along our ranks, that gather, pause and renew. We watch these flakes drifting up and down in the uncaring wind, but nothing happens. So again, lack of war, or lack of threat from war, and more of a threat from the weather. It's cold and difficult, harsh, cold, difficult, a lot of cold imagery, snow and ice rain. You might interpret all of these references to the weather as a kind of pathetic fallacy, they're sort of foreshadowing the violence that's going to come, or you might interpret them, I think, as Owen did being a religious poet, as a, a sort of sign that God is not approving of this behaviour of humans. So he, he kind of saw nature and the brutality of nature when humans faced it as a, an example of God's uh, judgment, I think, of what humans are capable of doing to one another in a moment of war. So, yeah, it's always important, whether you're religious or not, to kind of understand the poet themselves or the writer themselves, if they're religious or atheist, that's going to affect their perception of the world. And Owen is a very religious poet. So, yeah, the, the kind of way that he describes nature is an extension of his understanding of God and the world that he sees um, his God is creating. So it's an interesting and quite important to analyse his work that way. Pale snowflakes creep upon us stealthily as if they are frozen fingers that come feeling for our faces. We cringe in holes retreating into our forgotten dreams. Dazed by the snow, we see deeper into our dreams and memories. We stare into the grassier ditches of our past. Here, the poem shifts a lot. I want you to try and see if you can figure out what is that shift. So they're at the beginning of stanza five. They're covered in snowflakes and the snowflakes are like feeling for their faces and they're in the holes. And then they retreat into forgotten dreams. They retreat into their dreams. And they're so dazed by the cold of the snow and the kind of difficult shock of the situation that they start to go kind of back into their minds, like their brain disengages from the reality around them because it's too bizarre and difficult to engage with. So their brains kind of shift inwards. And remember grassier ditches of their past, so nice grassy hills and and um, valleys that they used to sit on rather than these muddy trenches that humans have made. Times when they were lying in a different kind of trench in a better place, living better lives than they do now. They start dropping off to sleep, being made drowsy by the sun. So they're awakened in shock at night and exhausted by the time the sun comes up. So they're drowsy, they're sleepy. And then they kind of, I think, the last sort of line of this uh, stanza is to do with a visual image. It's kind of like a dream image. 
imagining ourselves being covered in flowers that trickle where a blackbird uh, is hopping around. I think he says fusses. I'll read you the um, actual line because it's better than my, my explanation of it there. Yeah, so we cringe in holes back on forgotten dreams and stare snow days deep into grassier ditches. So we drowse sun does littered with blossoms trickling where the blackbird fusses. So it's really crazy because they're awake at night and they're sort of drowsing off to sleep in the day and they're kind of present in the moment, but then they're disengaging into dreams. So the, there's all this kind of ambiguity, like they're in two different states. And I think uh, in a way, this is also representing the way that they're in this kind of state between life and death. They're sort of in this no man's land. In some way, if uh, you're religious and you believe in uh, Christianity as Owen did, you might see that as similar to something like purgatory. They're in this kind of state of nothing happening. And they don't know if it's going to get better or worse. And they're just kind of in this no man's land in between. So yeah, this really nice image of spring, blossoms trickling where the blackbird fusses is contrasted with all this icy snow imagery. And then we get a pause, a caesura, a dash here. And then he says, is it that we're dying? So he's trying to figure out if this is death or just sleep. A lot of very good writers actually combine imagery of death and sleep and uh, think of sleep as a sort of temporary state that's a bit like death so he's kind of drawing on tradition there as well the true tradition stanza six <laughs> slowly our spirits drag us back to thoughts of home so slowly our ghosts drag home so his thoughts or his soul or his kind of the way that he's being feels like it's getting displaced out of the moment of war that he's in and placed into a moment of home, what the home must be like now that they left behind. We notice that there are sunken fires that have almost burned out. They're deceptively crusted with dark red embers that look like jewels. Crickets gather around them and make jingling noises. For hours, the innocent mice celebrate the warmth of these fires. The house is theirs. So the fires are almost burned out in the houses that they left. And there are things moving in. Nature, actually, moving in. Mice and crickets. With its shutters and doors all closed on us, the doors of our old houses are closed. Uh, that was quite a powerful line. I think you might want to underline that poem, uh, that line, sorry, in the poem if you're annotating. Again, I'll go back to it. Sorry, I know it's taken me just much longer than normal to do the summary, but I think it's really important to get used to the story here before you go any deeper into anything. And like I say, this is not an easy poem, but if you learn this one, it's really good. It compares and contrasts with almost anything in your collection. So yeah, shutters and doors all closed. On us, the doors are closed. We turn back to our dying. It's just re repeating and it's saying, you know, for us, there's no hope of going home. There's no option. So because there's no option to go back home, they're not really, you know, they decided it's not worth dreaming anymore. And they turn back to their moment of dying and suffering from the cold that they're in at the moment. And then stanza seven shifts again a little bit because it's trying to figure out why do they do this and he says we turn back to our dying because we believe that if we don't go to war then kind and good fires won't continue to burn the sun smiles truly on child or field or fruit even though it doesn't smile upon us our love turns to fear because we're fighting for god's invincible spring which I see as interpretable, <laughs> I can't say that word, as a brighter, better future with the innocence of new life. Therefore, we're not loath, we're not reluctant as we lie out here waiting. It's for this reason that we were born, because the love of God in this world seems to be dying, and it's our job 
to rekindle it. So in some ways, he's sort of ideologically driven. He's driven by his religious beliefs that war is horrible, but necessary in some ways. He's fighting in a way that he thinks will benefit other more innocent things than himself, child or field or fruit, though it doesn't smell upon him and the other soldiers. There's a chance that the world can be a better place for the future. So it's sort of shifting a little bit into a more hopeful tone or kind of a tragic tone because he and the other soldiers are sacrificing themselves, but also they have this kind of pure belief that what they're doing is better, is going to make the world better. Because the love of God seems dying, it's a bit of a weird line, so we'll have a look at that uh, a little bit more in um, later in this lesson because it's yeah, a strange one. There's a few different interpretations I've read of that one, and I'm not exactly sure which one it definitely is. So if you have a, an idea of what your interpretation of that one is, it's a good, probably doing better than me. So finally, stanza eight is kind of more, less abstract, less dreamlike, less spiritual, more realistic, what is practically happening. Tonight, this frost will fasten on the mud in ourselves. It will shrivel our hands and make our foreheads wrinkly and crisp. The group of people who are burying the dead with their picks and shovels shaking as they grasp them will pause as they look at the dead people's faces and realize that they half know them. The eyes of the dead men are frozen over, but nothing happened. So they're dying, these soldiers, while they're waiting to fight. They're not even fighting and dying for any cause. They're dying because of the cold and because of the uh, physical and psychological pressure that's placed upon soldiers in war. So it's a very interesting look at war and what it feels like to be a soldier. And it's very different from a lot of other poems in the collection. Good, so hopefully you're still with me and you're feeling like you understand the poem a bit more. Definitely have a look at this scribbly handout for this one, print the sheet out if you need it and go through all of these notes again if you need it. It's gonna take a little while to get used to it. I actually, probably out of any poem in this collection, this is the one I struggled with most, even though I liked it, one of the best. Um, so if you find it a hard poem with a lot of difficult ideas, then you're probably right <laughs> and if you think it's very obvious and easy I would encourage you to to sort of look again because um yeah even I find it quite challenging the first time I was taught this poem and the first time I started teaching it to students I did have the opinion that it was quite straightforward and kind of quite easy to analyze uh, but yeah my opinion on that has definitely changed over time so you can sort of get quite a lot out of it straight away but if you want to really understand it and write about it in a sophisticated way then you need to stay longer with this type of poetry so thank you for bearing with me while we go through all of its ideas and hopefully you're finding it quite interesting and intellectually engaging like it's making you think quite differently about these themes of power and conflict it's a nice picture of poor wilfred owen <laughs> we're gonna learn a little bit about him now i think some poems, you can kind of just get them how they are. And with exposure, there is a lot you can get just by reading it. But if you know about him and you know more about his history, it's going to make a lot more sense to you. So I'll spend a little bit of time going through some key context points with you now. Feel free to jot these down around the poem or to write these separately on maybe the back of the poem, if you like. So firstly, Owen is a British poet. He lived from 1893 to 1918. So he's not very old. In my head, I have that he's 25 years old. I think that's right, but double check it because I'm really bad with numbers sometimes and they just get stuck in my head wrong. So in my head, he's 25 when he died. He's a very important war poet and may be considered one of the most important poets of the First World War, along with his one of his best friends, Siegfried Sassoon, who also was a poet and they have really interesting letters that they exchange to each other on how to write poetry or their opinions on the war and their experiences. They actually met while they were in um, a hospital recovering from war together. So they both kind of drawn 
to each other through their experiences. So, yeah, the First World War, obviously the first war that is, you know, involving a large portion of the world, a lot more brutal than wars that are just individual countries or individual places. So you can see that this despondency and this kind of shock that they have in the poem is probably a reflection of the fact that the scope of this war is so much greater than any war that's gone before. His general opinions on war are so different to the average person of his time. So nowadays we're quite used to the idea of critiquing soldiers as well as supporting them. And we understand that some people oppose war and they think that uh, soldiers are violent or that they're kind of misguided, blinded by ideology. They never really go to war for the right reasons because there are no right re reasons to start killing each other. That is a not an opinion that everyone holds, but it's quite a common opinion nowadays. In Owen's time, this is not really anything that anybody thought. He himself didn't think this until he became a soldier. So after being a soldier in war, he became really disillusioned with the um, honourable portrayal of it in the media and the propaganda. And he rejected that. And his poetry is really showing a very different angle and perspective on, on what it's like to really be in that moment of war. As I've said a few times, he's also very religious. So he's an Anglican Christian. You can look up what this means and what this type of religion is if you're interested in that. But the main thing to understand is that his religiousness is his poetry and his poetry is his spirituality and his spirituality is his religion. So some people aren't spiritual and they write poetry in a personal way, but it's not spiritual or they might be atheistic and they're not religious. So their atheist worldview uh, kind of interacts with the way that they interpret the world around them. In Owen's case, he's uh, hyper-religious, very Christian, which is quite normal for his time. And so the way that he sees the world and the mechanisms of the world and what's really going on with the wars is all reflective of his religious beliefs. So you have to kind of respect those in order to understand him and why he's writing in this particular way, even if it's different from your own personal beliefs. So I said um, this line is a bit weird <laughs> and I'm gonna just uh, kind of go into like what's weird about it here. So for love of God seems dying. When I've read analyses of this poem, and to be fair, most analyses I read were not really, in my mind, really sufficient to understand this poem. Uh, there seems to be two main interpretations of this line. So the first one is that his own love of God, his own beliefs are starting to die because the war is so brutal around him. He's thinking, how on earth can you know, this happen in a world with a God, which is quite often an atheist perspective. So um, if there's so much suffering and dying in the world, why would a God create that deliberately? It seems cruel. So, you know, likely there's no God, or if there is, it's not a kind of God that you want to be following because they seem to have quite odd ways about how the world should work. That's often a, a sort of anti-spiritual line of thought. So that's one interpretation. His own love of God seems to be dying. He seems to be losing his faith. The other one, which I personally feel is more likely, given that Owen generally was a highly religious poet, is that the love of God seems to be fading from the world. Other people are losing their love of God. Owen and the other soldiers have a belief still. And so they fight, it's kind of like their duty to be soldiers because they feel like they're trying to restore order and balance the world and they're trying to restore faith and spirituality along with it. So either other people are losing faith or he is losing faith. And you personally can totally decide which of those interpretations you prefer. And you might actually explore both of them in an essay as well. So yeah, like I say, I prefer that second one, but um, more than enough people disagree and, and do that first one for you to choose whichever one you like there. There's not a straightforward answer to that, that conundrum. So World War II, uh, sorry, World War I, um, I recommend understanding the wars to be able to understand this poetry collection, especially 
the first and second world war they're really crucial um i know it's not history it's literature but with this type of poetry the more you understand about the history and connect your understanding to that the better you're going to analyze so you kind of have to treat it like it's history in, in some ways even if you're not that into history so he drew on his own direct experiences of war especially from world war one 1914 to 1918. this war is very complex the reasons that start it and no one predicted it and it kind of just spiraled out of control and several european forces mobilized against other european forces and suddenly other countries had to pile in and join one side or another and eventually it felt like a good chunk of the world was at war which is why it's called the first world war it doesn't mean every country's at war but a lot of them were <laughs> so yeah um it's a very un unexpected war in some ways it's a very chaotic war a very confusing war it's not really clear who's going to win or not it's not exactly clear like in, in the Second World War, it's sort of generally regarded now. Most people would agree that the Nazis were bad and people who supported the Nazis weren't all bad. Some of them were misguided, but generally Hitler is regarded as bad and people who oppose Hitler are regarded as, as better. But with the First World War, there's no such distinction. It's so much more complicated than that. So he's fighting a war where he's not really sure whether he's on the right side or not or who the enemy is, or why they're enemies. There's a lot of confusion behind the idea of it, which probably translates to some of the confusion in the poem. This poem was written in 1918, but it wasn't published until he died. And Owen himself died in 1918, so he died uh, a few months, I think possibly even a few weeks before the end of the war. It's really, really sad. He almost made it out, and he didn't quite... Um, so yeah, he never actually saw this poem published. It wasn't one that he knew people would read. It was one that, uh, after he died, became popular. I think it's also important that this is related to Keats's Ode to a Nightingale. Keats is another of my favourite poets and absolutely Wilfred Owen's, you know, number one poet. So yeah, if you want to understand Wilfred Owen more, you can also read Keats because that's where he gets all his ideas from. Well, that and war, obviously. <laughs> war and his own experiences, but then also Keats and Keats's poetry, uh, Owen's influences. So, yeah, this Ode to a Nightingale starts with My Heart Aches, and it's about... Um, odes are kind of like celebrations of things. So Keats's odes, even though Keats is a very tragic, sad poet in his own right, his odes are sort of like celebrations of different things that are kind of beautiful about the world and he changes my heart aches in this poem Owen changes it to our rather than my and our brains rather than heart our brains ache so he's focusing on the mind rather than the soul it's not something that they feel it's something that they're trying to intellectualize his mental abilities are failing him almost like he can't comprehend or process properly the world that's going on around them and I think that's why they dis dissociate as well they detach themselves they feel like the noise that they can hear around them is like a rumor of a different war because it, they can't understand that it's happening to them they feel like the bullets mean nothing because they're so cold and numb anyway they sleep in the day and they wake in the night and they dream rather than trying to process what's happening in their reality so it's a really confusing situation and the first image of the poem it's always good to analyze the opening line and the ending line of a poem because that sort of takes you through this sh shape or scope of it so it starts with the idea that their brains are hurting physically but also psychologically from not being able to process what's going on um, yeah, so I, I tried to find some World War I soldiers in the trenches. I managed to find this picture. You'll notice that they have a dog for company. I'm really, I love dogs. I have three at the moment myself. So yeah, I'm always finding dogs and things. Good trench dog. I hope he survived. So yeah, you can see um, these guys appear to be Scottish from their kilts, but <laughs> you can see kind of how it would feel to be in a trench. 
so it protects them. They sort of look over the top, and that's why they shoot. 